All right, beloved, this morning, we're gonna jump into the word of God. I've got a message for you that I'm super excited about. I've entitled it, Paul, Prison, and Pestilence. And I believe this is a timely word for troubling times. Now, before we get into the word today, I just wanna bring up some observations that I've been making. You know, remember just a few months back as the, as the year was getting ready to change and we were gonna you know, move into 2020, it was, a, it was a year that was supposed to uh, bring clear vision to all of us, right? The play on words, 2020 vision. We were gonna start seeing things clearly. And friends, over the last couple weeks, we have been seeing things very clearly, but what we've been seeing hasn't been very pretty. And I'm talking about in the nation and in the church both. We've seen that we're less prepared in all ways for challenging times than we ever thought possible. We've seen that we've been less spiritually prepared for troubling times. We are less physically or materially prepared for these troubling times. We're less medically prepared. We have learned that we've been less prepared than we ever thought. We've also seen that we're more addicted, more addicted to the creature comforts of life than we ever realized. I mean, our, our world has changed so fast and so quick, and right away where so many are just rattled because just the normal processes and enjoyments of life have been challenged, we don't know what to do about it. We've seen that we're more selfish than we've previously been willing to admit. All we have to do is talk about the fights and everything that have broken out in grocery stores, and it's, it's very, very sad. And what's the root of that? Selfishness. I'm gonna get mine. I don't care about anybody else. I'm gonna hoard by, and I'm gonna make sure I've got so much. I don't care if anybody else doesn't have enough just to get what they want. I'm gonna stock up and forget everybody else. Wow. Really? Is that what we want to do? Is that who we are? Is that what we want to become? Is that what we want to show our children? I hope not. We've also seen that we're more faithless than we ever imagined. People's faith has been rocked, and, and I get it. I don't say that you know, arrogantly or whatever, but friends, listen. When times like this happen and our faith gets challenged big time, and we see that our actual faith has been challenged and it's moved into kind of a, a crisis of faith or a lapse of faith, it's a great opportunity to recognize it, repent of it, receive God's forgiveness, but then to have your, fret, your faith refreshed and renewed as well. And so if that's been you, if you have found yourself faithless over the last couple of weeks, I pray that your faith gets renewed. We've also seen that we're more fearful than we've ever considered. We've also seen that we're more shakable than we're comfortable confessing. And then finally, we have seen that we're more misguided than we could ever really comprehend. Again, this could have been said a week or so ago, but toilet paper is what we're running for. Toilet paper is what we're beating people up over to get to the, the aisle first. Toilet paper, really? Someone asked this question last night. I thought it was hilarious. Forgive my sick sense of humor. But someone asked the question, if cold and flu symptoms caused us to run for toilet paper, okay, if there was a diarrhea outbreak, would we run for nasal spray? Just something for you to consider on this happy Sunday morning. Listen, friends, we haven't just been exposed to the coronavirus, we've been exposed by the coronavirus. And what it has exposed in us isn't pretty. It's not good looking at all. And so the church, I'm convinced of this right now, the church needs a word from God so that we can live above the fear and hysteria that is overcoming so many people so that we can live in such a way that we shine in darkness and be a beacon of hope to people in the world who are flailing and failing right now in life. Now, part of what we're doing to reach as many people as we can, last Monday, I started a Facebook Live series called Promises Not Panic. And I wanna invite you to come to that. It's at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. 
We get together, we open the word together, we have communion and prayer. It's been enjoyed by tens of thousands of people around the world, literally. People who are coming and watching live, people who are watching it later because it's archived on Facebook. You can watch it on the YouTube channel. You can download the notes. Listen, this is a resource for you so that you can have panic vanquished from your life and so that faith can be preserved. And so I want to encourage you, go to my public figure page and start following with the rest of us around the world. And let's again be beacons of hope and faith and life to a world that's panicking right now. All right, now with all that being said, let's get into the word of God this morning. I want to start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. The apostle Paul writes and says these words, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now let me tell you something about prayer and worship, okay? When God tells us to give ourselves to rejoicing always, to be thankful in all things, and to pray unceasingly, God's not saying that because he's some you know, um, dictator that is just trying to drive us to spiritual disciplines. No way. This is the invitation from a loving father giving us clues, listen to me, giving us clues about how we can experience the miraculous power of God released into our troubling times. Make no question about it. That's exactly what God is doing. God commands it because prayer and worship causes God to release things from his throne that benefit mankind. And they come in, listen to me, friends, they come to impossible circumstances. Now, does that sound good to you? You want to see God release something into your impossible circumstance? Then give yourselves to praying and rejoicing and giving thanks because this is God's will for us. Now I wanna unpack some examples of this that we find in the scripture. The first one is the story of the children of Israel all the way back in the book of Exodus. The children of Israel have been enslaved by the Egyptians and and it's, it's a horrible enslavement, so much so that it says the children of Israel were groaning and crying out to God. And what is God's response? He finds Moses in the distant land of Midian, and he speaks to Moses there, and he says, hey, I want you to go back to the children of Israel and let them know that I want to deliver them. So Moses goes back, he gathers the elders together, gathers the people together, and tells them what God has promised them. And now here's their response. Exodus chapter four, verse 31 says this. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Now listen, friends. Before a single thing changed in their circumstance, they believed They bowed their heads in prayer and they worshiped God. What is this? This is promise over panic. This is believing the promises of God and not panicking in the moment. They didn't wait for things to get better before they would praise and worship God. No, right there in their individual circumstance, right there before anything changed, they're responding to the promises of God bowing their heads in prayer and worshiping because they realize if they'll do that, God will release something from heaven into their circumstance and deliverance will come. And that's exactly what happened. Deliverance did come and it was dramatic and miraculous and supernatural because God does these types of things. The second example I wanna give you quickly is the example of the children of Israel being invaded by the Moabites and the Ammonites. Now you can read this whole thing in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I would encourage you to do that, but I just want you to be aware that it was an impossible situation for the children of Israel. They were seriously outnumbered by the Moabites and the Ammonites, 
There was no hope for them in the natural. And so King Jehoshaphat goes to prayer. Now look at what he says. This is just part of his prayer, 2 Chronicles 20, 12. He says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them, speaking of the Moabites and the Ammonites, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but, I love Bible buts, but our eyes are upon you. I love this. God, we're, we're just being honest here. We, we're outnumbered, we're overwhelmed. Lord, we don't know what to do. How, how can we fight against this opposition? We don't know what to do. We're outnumbered and outpowered, God. But here's what we know. Our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. We're not putting our eyes on the Moabites and the Ammonites. We're not denying that they're there. We know they're there. But this is an issue of focus. And what we're choosing to focus on, oh God, is you. Because we remember what you did for the children of Israel. We remember what you've done throughout history. And so now we're going to position and posture ourselves by keeping our eyes on you. Church, this is our calling right now. This isn't what we can do. This is what we must do right now. Now what happens here in the rest of the story? In the rest of Jehoshaphat's prayer, he says these words, and I, I, find th I love this about this prayer. Jehoshaphat recites the promise that God gave King Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7 much earlier in history. And so when God is talking to King Solomon, what does he say? He said, Solomon, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, that's drought, or I command the locusts to devour the land, that's devouring, and if I send pestilence among my people, that's disease, drought, devouring, and disease. Then God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'm gonna hear from heaven. Then I'm gonna forgive their sin, and then I'm going to heal their land. What is Jehoshaphat doing right there? He's recounting the promises of God in his day, in his time, and in his circumstance. He's saying, God, remember what you said. You, you've done this before, you've promised this before, but now right here in our day and in our time, God, we are calling out and crying out to you right now because we need you now. We don't know what else to do. We're outnumbered and overwhelmed. And God, our eyes are on you. Our prayer is directed toward you. Lord, what else do you want us to do? <laughs> you know, only God could do this. The scripture then says that the spirit of God fell upon one of the prophets and the spirit of God informed the prophet, here's what your battle plan is. I want you to go to war against the Moabites and the Ammonites, but I don't want you to put your shields and your bucklers and your swords and your chariots out front. I want you to put the prayers and the worshipers, I want you to put the singers out front because this battle isn't yours, it's God's. And what is God saying again? Prayer and worship releases the miraculous power of God into an overwhelming, outnumbered circumstance that brings about miracles. Friends, we've got to believe that. We've got to believe that. And we've got to start living that way. Come on, wake up, rise up, shake off the fear. Shake it off. Come on, we can be better than this. Allow the spirit of God to do something in you to vanquish your panic and your fear. Come on, let's live a little higher. Let's lift our heads a little higher, a little more nobler, come on. Well, how does the story end? They send the worshipers out there first, they send the prayers out there, and God dramatically delivers them. And one more time, this is promises over panic. They recited the promise of God. They obeyed what God told them to do in the moment, and God came through for them. Our third and final example is Paul and Silas. 
Paul and Silas in a Philippian prison. Now friends, listen to me. I know that these are all popular stories, but we've gotta take a fresh look at every single one of these. Paul and Silas find themselves in a Philippian prison. They have been beaten with metal rods across their back. They've been beaten with metal rods. After that, the scripture tells us that they weren't just thrown in prison, they were thrown into the interior of the prison. They were in the dungeon of the prison. They were as deep and locked down and as desperate as they possibly could be. And then on top of that, the scripture says that they put their feet in stocks. So they're locked up in the dungeon, in the innermost parts of the prison. They've been beaten with rods. They're in a jail cell, and there's a jailer outside the door watching them. I mean, you talk about a bad day, that's a bad day. Now, we wonder, okay, how's the story progress from there? Do we find Paul and Silas sitting in their troubled condition saying, oh God, I can't believe this is happening. Where are you? Where are you in the midst of this? We, we were just preaching the gospel and we helped get this demon-possessed girl delivered and the town turned on us and beat us up and threw us in prison. We're in stocks and guarded and it's stinky and painful. God, where are you? Not at all. They don't even move one inch in that direction. Acts 16, 25 and 26 says, but at midnight, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. <clears throat> Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. There's so much I love about this story, but the first thing I wanna draw your attention to is this. We don't have any record that God gave them a promise in that moment. We don't, we don't have a story that says, and in the midst of their misery, God whispered from heaven and said, boys, I'm gonna bust you out of here in just a few minutes, just keep calm. We have no record of a specific promise but what we do have is the historical nature of God and the historical miraculous interventions of God that caused Paul and Silas in that moment to say, I'm gonna tap into who God has been throughout human history and believe him to do it right here in my circumstance. Come on, somebody, that's incredible. They didn't have to hear a now word from God. They had heard who God was and they made it a now word for them in that moment. I love that. Prayer and worship in troubling times is the key to God's dramatic deliverance. It was in Egypt. It was with Jehoshaphat. It is with Paul and Silas. We could give you many, many more examples throughout the scripture. Prayer and worship in troubling times, it's the key to God's dramatic deliverance. Now what else do I love about this story? It says that the prisoners were listening to them. Don't you think? <laughs> the prisoners were listening to them. They were the only ones worshiping and praising God and praying and crying out to God. And it was so unusual and it was so unheard of that it got the rest of the prisoners' attention. And the Holy Spirit moves on Luke while he's writing Acts chapter 16. And what does he say? Make sure you write that the other people were watching and listening what does that tell us today? Here's what it tells us today, that there are people watching how the church is responding to this issue right now. They are watching us, they are looking at us, and they're wanting to see if we are shrieking back in fear and shrieking back in selfishness or whether we're praising God and thanking God. Again, not flippantly, but genuinely. 
praising and worshiping God because we know coronavirus or prison cells, God is worthy and able to deliver and to set free. Come on, that needs to be our message right now. So the prisoners were listening. Friends, the world is watching today. My question for us that follow Jesus is, what are they seeing? What are they hearing when they look upon and listen to our lives? I hope it's faith-filled, fearless, compassionate, generous living. I hope that when they look at us, they see light in darkness, faith in the midst of fear. We have to do this. This is our moment to get it right, and we must. We dare not look at it and say, well, I'm just gonna you know, live fearful and selfish and whatever, and God will forgive me later. God forbid that we would adopt that mentality. Don't ever think about it. Don't even think about living like that. Now what happens next? It says as they prayed and worshiped that an earthquake happened. And the foundation of the prison was shaken. And all the doors and everyone's chains were loosed. The very thing that held them was shaken because they weren't shaken. Think about that. The very foundation of the prison that imprisoned them was shaken. And it was shaken because they weren't. They weren't shaken by the rods and the beating and the imprisonment and the stocks. They weren't, they weren't shaken by the, de the desperation of the situation. They kept their eyes on God. They knew that he was able. And so through prayer and worship, they waited for the miracle maker. What if that would get on us? If we would quit allowing ourselves to be shaken so easily, so easily. I wanna pray prayers. I wanna sing songs. I wanna lead myself in worship with such genuineness, with such hunger and desperation that the foundation of the things that try to imprison me, they themselves are shaken to the core and they can't help but release me and other people who are watching me. I love that this passage says that not, worth, not just the foundations were shaken, but all the doors of the prison cells were open and everyone's chains were loosed. If we get this right, church, listen to me. If we get this right, we're gonna see other people set free. Come on, there's so much in the balance right now. How you respond, what you do, it matters to people who are watching. I wanna see people's prison doors open. I wanna see the chains that bind them and shackle them to fear and hopelessness and worry. I wanna see people delivered as they watch and listen to the church of the living God, worship and prayer and watch them move. Beloved, we've got the opportunity. Let's please make the most of it. Let's make the most of it at this time right now. Without question, prayer and worship releases the miraculous power of God in impossible situations. No wonder it's the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. No wonder. Now, this is just an interesting point as we get ready to close now. We started this message with 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you know when the Apostle Paul wrote those words? He wrote those words two to three years after he had his Philippian jail experience. 
So when Paul is writing 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, I can't help but think he isn't writing it with a little wink, wink in his eye. He's thinking back on what happened to him in that Philippian prison. And he says, church, you want to know the key to seeing God move miraculously in troubling times? Remember what happened to me in Philippi? We rejoiced always. We prayed without ceasing. In everything, we gave thanks. And I'm telling you now, he said, this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Church, we don't have to wonder what God wants from us right now. God wants this. Prayer and worship, giving of thanks. What does God want from us? Light in darkness. What does God want for, from us? Generosity in the midst of selfishness. What does he want? He wants giving instead of hoarding. What he wants is to see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the testimony of the church in troubling times. Get back to Acts chapter 16. How does the story end? Okay, so the place is shaken and the doors are open and everybody's chains are loosed and the jailer himself is panic stricken. Oh my, what's happening here? And so it says that he runs in, Acts 16, 29 and 33. He says, then the jailer called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought him out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all those who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes from the beatings they had received. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. You see what we're talking about? We're talking about us getting it right to such a great degree that people meet Jesus we pray for revival, we pray for awakening. Now listen to me. God gave the opportunity of the coronavirus so that people will start wondering about eternal things and that the church can start living with a mission mindset according to God's principles and purposes, so that people can find Christ. If they would have been fearful and complaining and disgusted about what was going on in their life, nobody's chains would have been loosed, nobody's doors would have been opened, and that man and his family wouldn't have come to Christ. But they got it right. Prayer and worship in the midst of darkness and trouble. God intervenes miraculously and an entire family comes to saving faith in Jesus. Church, how we respond determines people's willingness to hear, believe, and receive Jesus as their savior. If you are without Jesus Christ in your life right now, I wanna say to you as boldly and as lovingly as I know how, Jesus is your answer. Jesus is everybody's answer. And if you've never surrendered your life to him and you're like the Philippian jailer from 2,000 years ago saying, Steve, what do I have to do to be saved? I'm gonna tell you right now. First of all, you need to repent. You need to repent. It just means to change your heart, change your mind, and change your direction. You need to quit running from God and run to God. You need to repent. Next, you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world who died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and rose on the third day to prove that he has mastery and authority over death, hell, and the grave. You need to repent, you need to believe, and you need to receive. 
Because the scripture says, to as many as receive Jesus, he's given them the right to become the children of God. Repent, believe, and receive. Now one more thing. Jesus said this. He said, if you'll acknowledge me in front of people, I will acknowledge you in front of my Father in heaven. What does that mean? It means there's no such thing as a closet follower of Jesus. It means your faith, your belief in Jesus has to be real enough that you take a stand for him even in very difficult times. Are you ready to receive Christ right now? I pray that you are. We can do it right here, right now. You can pray with me. And if you pray with me right now to receive Christ, I want you to let us know right there on Facebook. You can let us know. You can also send us an email, hello at gracechapel.net. We want to reach out to you, love you, send you a Bible, get you started on your new walk with Jesus. But we want to help you. We want to bring you the hope of Christ. He is your only hope. Make no bones about it. This world has been shaken over the last two weeks. This world has shut down in the last two weeks. And the only thing that remains that we can count on is the person of Jesus Christ himself. Give him your life today. Do it. All right, so right where you're at, if you want to receive Christ, you want to recommit your life to him, you've been backslidden, running around, doing your own thing, it's time for you to repent. Either way, let's make a commitment for Jesus right now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, say it with me right here, right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent of my sins. God, I turn toward you. I turn away from my sin and my shame and my guilt. God, I believe that Jesus Christ is my savior. I want him to save me right now. I receive him. I receive Jesus right now as my savior. And I confess, I acknowledge him. I believe I believe, I receive right now, right now, right where you're at. If you prayed that prayer, as simple as it is, something miraculous just happened. You've become a child of God through Jesus Christ. You are filled with him, filled with his spirit, and your future is heaven and not hell. Your future on this earth is life and peace and not death and fear. If you prayed that prayer, you let us know right now. If you're on Facebook, let us know. I prayed to receive Jesus right now. We'll get in touch with you. We're not gonna bug you, but we do wanna bless you. If you wanna send us an email, if that's better for you, hello at gracechapel.net. Let us know you receive Christ. All right, friends, all right, family, listen. This is an opportune time. Church, we gotta get this right, and let's watch people come into the kingdom of God like never before. Again, see you tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. Promises, not panic, on my public Facebook page. And let's keep pressing into Jesus, beloved. God bless you mightily. Thank you for letting us in your home today. We'll see you real, real soon. God bless you.